So, yeah, I'm here today to talk to you about something that actually doesn't come from research stuff, but just from something that we've actually done based on a real problem that we faced. So, uh, we, we had a lot of interesting talks today, and um, unfortunately, my brain isn't web scale enough to sort of grasp everything, but I, I thought it was very interesting, all of it, and, and very impressive. This is going to be technically uh, sound, sound engineering, but definitely not as complicated or impressive as some of the stuff we've seen today. But this is real world stuff, and it is important. So, um, yeah, with that, let's dig in. Um, so, let's start with a problem statement. I love incremental processing, and you should do this too. Like, in practice, uh, in big companies, ETL pipelines, it's all about derived data. You ingest your data, then you run a, a step to clean it up, you enrich it, join with dimension tables, augment it, then you aggregate it into business level aggregates and that shows up on dashboards, right? That's what people do in practice. And the trouble with this is that your input data changes. You get new data, but there's, so there's late arriving data like for, for several days ago because something was down and then gives you data now. Uh, you do cleanup patch-ups because your cleanup wasn't entirely correct. There's GDPR cleanups that have to be propagated through the entire thing to clean up data that shouldn't be there anymore. So traditional ETL setups often use like this coarse-grained batch processing to deal with this. For instance, people partition their data by date and then every day they run uh, a job that recomputes that derived data for the each of the last seven days separately, and, uh, and that's the way they deal with this late arriving or changing data. And it's kind of a waste because often just a couple of records change. Incremental is much more efficient. You can do things in O of the number of changes, but it's a lot more complicated to do, so that's why people don't do it, unless the system does it for them. And that's where Automa automatic incrementalization techniques come in. So uh, Databricks has uh, Delta Live Tables, materialized views. Snowflake has similar, uh, similar features uh, with dynamic tables. Um, so what I'm talking about today is the underlying fundamentals of what it takes to do that and what you need. So if you want to do incremental updates to a derived data set, what do you need to know? One, you need to know which rows were changed in your sources since the last time you updated that derived data. And number two, how do those changed rows affect your derived data? So how do I need to change my derived data to incorporate those changes? And so there are, of course, solutions for this, and we needed to have some, something. So what we built was something we call row tracking. Uh, anytime I see this, I'm my mind actually says uh, row stalking. It's kind of creepy, but like you, you follow, them, follow them around wherever they go. That's actually where the talk title sort of comes from, from my creepy mind. Anyway, um, what does this do? For every row in the system, we can automatically track a unique ID, a row ID. That ID is stable, so it doesn't change when the row is updated. It's also never reused, so it's unique for the lifetime of the table. Next to that, we track a row commit version, which is the most recent table version in which the row was changed. So when it's inserted, you get the table version when it was inserted, and when it gets updated, that number gets bumped to the version in which it's updated. So, uh, and key thing is this doesn't change when the data is reorganized or something. It's not a physical thing. Not, none of this changes when the data is reorganized. Um, this is all at the logical level. And it's automatic, it's hidden, so it's not part of the schema, but you can get it for any row. So, silly example here, just some, a table with some rows and row IDs and row commit versions, right? So every row ID is unique, and the row commit versions say when the row was inserted or updated. So, how do you answer question number one with this information? Well, so if you want to know which rows changed, and let's say you have two versions of your table, version eight 
and version 11. So as you may notice, there's a couple of commits in between. Each commit is, is a version, and you want to know the differences. So, um, well, actually, what, what you can do is you can do a full outer join on these things based on the uh, IDs, on the row IDs, and then you can figure this out. So, for instance, for a row with ID 23, um, the row ID is the same, of course, because we joined by it, but the uh, row commit version changed. So that's clearly an update. And there's a row in version 8 that isn't in the table on the other side, so that's a delete. And similarly, there's something in the table at version 11 that wasn't there at, uh, at, at number 8, and that's an insert. Very simple, and you can do this purely based on row ID and row commit version. You don't have to compare any data values to figure this out. Of course, now, you can still, uh, when you want to use this to adjust a derived representation, you can see that for that row number 23, only the date changed. So if you don't care about the date in your derived representation, you might want to do an additional pass of, uh, well, effectivization, as I think it's called, to actually get the changes that you care about. But this is a very nice first pass. And you can do this relatively efficiently. There's all sorts of optimizations to do this uh, full outer join. Like you only have to look at the files in the table or the parts of the data that actually changed. And you can uh, actually fetch the data values lazily after you actually figure out the diffs, et cetera. There's all sorts of stuff that you can do with this. But this is the basics. Answering number quest question number two, how do those change, uh, changed rows affect my derived data? Now, let's say that we actually have a derived table based on version 8 of the table. And we have a, a diff that we derived, the diff that we got from the previous slide. This is, this is exactly the same diff. So for row 23, we have a pre-image and a post-image of the update, and we have an insert and a delete. So for the update, we just go to row number 23 in the derived table. In the derived table, we just store the row ID or row IDs that contributed to that particular row. Of course, this is a very simple example of a derived table. There's lots of techniques in the research literature about how you can do this with joins and with all sorts of other derived things, but the core principle is the same. You, you track where your data came from. So, so anyway, this is an update, so you can just update that. Row 88 needs to be inserted, and row 57 needs to be deleted. So that leaves you with this uh, updated variant of the table that is consistent with your input table at version 11. So of course, there's precedent for this. this Nothing is n new. Everybody needs to build this kind of stuff, right? Some systems have this under the covers. In many systems, I guess it would be done based on a primary key that you define, but primary keys are not always present in the kind of data lake, big data systems that we have, and uh, or they're not they're there, there, but they're not validated. So they might actually not be unique, or they might be like seven part, and you don't want to actually copy them down to your derived tables. They might be reusable, so you might actually get them back after they're deleted, and you get them back. So you don't actually know whether it's an update or just a delete and an insert. Um, you could create a primary key from a sequence, but that's manual work. Postgres and Oracle have sort of things there to get row IDs, but they're not stable enough. And the change tracking is usually not there natively unless you just build it manually using triggers. None of this is automatically present in the system like under the covers, but I'm sure that systems do it secretly and just don't tell you. I'm telling you, we're doing this. Um, so if you want to implement this, um, so uh, what are the challenges? Well, let's start with our system that we built this into. So we have this uh, storage system called Delta Lake, which stores, uh, it's open source. It stores relational database tables on cloud object stores with row data in Parquet files. So that's columnar storage. And there's a metadata log on top of that that tracks which files are in the table right now. So each commit to the table introduces a new table version with a new number. Um, and each commit basically says, 
remove these parquet files from the table and add these other parquet files to the table and then track some metadata with that, with those files like stats, etc. cetera. Um, you can time travel to earlier versions. Uh, so you can actually look at earlier versions, important for getting diffs. And uh, concurrent transactions in this system are handled using optimistic concurrency. So you read some data, you modify it, you write some new parquet files, you try to commit somebody else committed first and committed like the version after the version you read, you have to resolve the conflict. It is your responsibility. That's optimistic concurrency for you. Take it or leave it. Um, so the simple implementation of this, what would it take? You just add physical columns to your parquet files, right? And you write there, let's say, you're thinking you read table version 12, so now you're committing version 13, right? So, and the last row ID that was given out was number uh, 101. So you give out 102 through 104, and you put the row commit version in there. Done, right? You commit, you commit. Uh, uh, no, that doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't. Why? Well, you actually don't know that yet. You don't know what the commit version is that you're going to commit this as. And you actually also don't know the next row ID that you can give out because you're only reserving these when you actually commit. The source of truth of that is in the commit log. So, yeah, we needed something else. So, yeah, how do you deal with this, right? You don't know this. So, step one of the trick, you store nulls there. So, because you don't know it yet. Then, number two is, in the file metadata that gets committed eventually to the table's commit log, you store uh, base values. So you, you store default values or base values. So in this case, you store the base row ID of 102, which you think is going to be the first one, and you store number 13, which you think is going to be the commit version. And then at, at read time, when you read the parquet file, you can actually number the rows, right? Just 0, 1, 2, etc. cetera. Um, so that's not in the files, you can just count them. And then, when you read the file back, you can actually reconstruct the numbers here. So you just say, if it's null, then we take the base row ID, and we add the row number to get a final result. So it, it's 102 plus 0 plus 1 plus 2. And the row commit version is null, so you just fill out the default from the metadata. Now, what if you have a transaction conflict? So you wrote these parquet files, right? So you did your entire transaction, you wrote that, you get a conflict. What happens? Well, now you're writing version 15 instead of 13. You resolved your conflicts. Now the next base row ID, or the row ID that you can give out is 127, you just update the metadata and you can still commit no rewrites of your parquets. So um, then you can actually recommit very quickly. So of course, that was all for inserts. You can also store updates. So if you update a row, then the row ID stays the same, but the commit version gets updated. So in that case, you wouldn't store null for the row ID, you would actually store the row ID that you want there. So that creates a, a gap in your row ID numbering, but that's okay. You just, um, yeah, you just materialize that. Sometimes you also want to copy unmodified rows. For instance, when you're compacting or consolidating files, doing data clustering, or with copy on write, if you have an entire parquet file full of rows and you're just updating one row, then you actually have to copy all of the remaining rows as well. Um, unless you're using posi positional deletes, but that's a different problem. So if you want to do that, if you copy a row verbatim, then you also have to just copy these field values verbatim and they don't need to get filled out because they don't, they're not supposed to change at a logical level, right? So anyway, that was the trick. Um, simple, uh, solid engineering problem that everybody needs to solve. So can you get this? Uh, yes, it's out there. It's an open source. Apache Iceberg is adding it too. Um, so it'll be in the two major lake house data formats soon. And 
we actually use this in production for incrementalizing materialized views in Databricks. So it's battle-tested, proven tech. So yeah, that's it. Um. Thanks, uh